and welcome everybody. I'm Laura Vosper, Talent Director here at Obelisk Support, and um, I'd like to thank you for joining us today to explore some of the trends that are shaping the future of legal work. Um, I'm delighted that we're co-hosting this event with our friends from LexisNexis, who are all about supporting legal professionals and legal teams as they add value through their uh, professional guidance tools and events like this. So welcome to our friends from Lexis. I'll be handing over in just a moment to Mark Smith, who's Director of Strategic Markets at Lexis. Um, but before the, I do that, I just have a couple of housekeeping points and uh, just a um, a uh, few moments to introduce our other guests today, Rustin, Rashda and Dana, hello. We are recording this today um, and we will be able to share this, uh, a link to the recording afterwards. If you do have colleagues who haven't been able to join us live, we will be making that available. We do have the question and answer session today. What we'll be doing, um, we will take the questions toward the end of the hour, um, but please do post those as you're going along. Um, we also have a couple of live polls as well. So please do share your thoughts on the live polls. Um, those are anonymous um, and we'll be running those through the course of the event. So it's my pleasure today to welcome three guests uh, to the panel. Uh, the first of those, Rash Dharana, uh, trained as a barrister and has practiced uh, on a multinational basis. She's a former general counsel and uh, also a non-executive director in the public sector. Rustam Ra is joining us as the legal director for Americas and the UK um, at BT, as well as leading a busy team there, looking at legal, regulatory and compliance matters. His past roles have included uh, working as a commercial director with businesses within BT and also the legal technology business ticket. Um, he also trained um, at the bar. And finally, Dana Dennis-Smith is CEO of Obelisk Support, a long-standing champion of flexible working and an innovator in this space. Dana also founded the First 100 Years Project, celebrating the history of women in law. And uh, she is now moving that forward into the next 100 years as well. So thank you very much for joining us today. We're really looking forward to the conversation. Mark, I'll hand over to you. Fabulous, thank you so much, Laura. Welcome everyone, delighted to be here, uh, both with you viewing and with our, with our panel. And as I was walking my dog this morning, instead of uh, sitting on a packed commuter train into, uh, into London, I, I began to reflect on how I would best put these mark this, this conversation into context. And at breakfast, I'd read uh, Bill and Melinda Gates' annual Gates Notes, which is a fantastic read if you, if you haven't seen it so far. And one of the phrases which really stood out for me was the description of the pandemic as the defining challenge for our generation in the way that our parents and our grandparents also had similar challenges. And when I thought about it in those terms, the thing that really came out for me for the last 12 months has been speed and pace. And driven by technology and interconnectedness, this idea of what Robert Colville calls the great acceleration has really, I think, impacted the lives of all of us and critically at work in-house counsel. We've seen a huge amount of change in organizations. The shift, of course, to digital working, where we'll, we'll perhaps start our conversation with the panel today. But also we've seen business models fail. We've seen business models adapt, new business model launch. We've seen talent redeployed, re restructured. We've seen new products launched. We've seen new ways of working emerge. All of this at a pace I don't think any of us would have believed possible uh, 12 months ago. Now, this has meant a huge amount of work for in-house counsel. The, the in-house uh, specialists that we talk to are busier than ever. They're looking at their contracts. It's force majeure. It's health and safety. It's risk mitigation. It's managing those sensitive employee projects. And I think it's put in-house counsel in a, uh, a position that perhaps is even more critical than they've been before. But what I don't think we've seen, and this is really where we can explore with our panel, is what are the longer term implications of this? And it, it, indeed, McKinsey did a survey of 200 uh, global CEOs uh, middle of last year. 90% of them saw their business fundamentally changing over the next five years as a result of the pandemic, with 75% of them seeing opportunity in there. 
And that, I think, is the context for our discussion today. There's, there's been huge change already, but I suspect there's far more to come. And in that will be both threat and opportunity. And that really, I think, uh, is where our panel can really add value. So before I hand over to them for some of their wisdom and insights, which I absolutely am confident they will deliver, um, let me ask uh, you joining us a question, which is really to ground us back in the here and now. Uh, we're interacting uh, remotely, and uh, Laura just has a, a poll to launch about some of the challenges that we're seeing with remote working. So Laura, if you could fire that off for us, please. Okay, so here's the question you should see in front of you. So the things that are most challenging about working remotely. So it is it around lack of impromptu collaboration. Is it around this kind of lack of space resources, you know, working environment at home? This classic issue of boundaries eroding between work and home life. Is it around visibility, you know, the lack of those collisions and the view across organizational boundaries? Or is it purely at a more human level, the lack of face-to-face -face interaction? So if you could just vote quickly, let's get a sense of what's going on in the, uh, in the room. Okay, Laura, let's see what, let's see what we've got. Okay, so really interesting split there. So lack of visibility just marginally ahead. And, and that's something I've heard time and time again. We, we see teams that have done a great job working out between them how to collaborate, how to communicate effectively, how to shift to this mode of working. Um, and yet while they've focused and put the, the, the emphasis on how do we work as a team and really done some tremendous things, then connecting the dots with other teams, I think is something that has, has not quite been nailed down yet. And once, hopefully, we move into a hybrid world where people are also remote and back into the office, a whole new set of, of challenges emerge. And, and you see this lack of impromptu collaboration come in a close second. And I think those two are, are tightly, uh, tight, tightly linked. Um, and then, you know, the lack of time and space at home, again, 10% of people, absolutely. And one of the things we see there is often, um, you know, a real generational challenge as well with some of the people who are um, in shared accommodation, for example, et cetera, in, in a much more challenging, um, challenging circumstances. So fabulous, thank you for that. We'll have another poll uh, just to close this discussion. So let's just stick with this theme of, of remote working. I'll go to my panel and, and let me go to uh, Rashta first. So we, we've seen this vast shift to remote working. So Rashta, what do you think will be the biggest implication of that shift for legal careers in the future? I think it's, um, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Laura, uh, and, and thank you to Oblis for and LexisNexis for organizing this very interesting conversation. Interestingly, as Mark was making his introductory comments, I thought if we had this panel discussion a year ago, it would have looked and been very, very different indeed. Um, not just that we are on Zoom and discussing it remotely, but also the topic and the focus that our discussion would have um, had. Um, I, think one of, I think one of the good things is, is as you said, that um, businesses right across the world in every sector have been forced to implement um, advancements in tech-enabled transformations, um, and they've had to do it very quickly. And we've seen the effect of not doing that with Debenhams and other retail industry um, players, and especially those who've been in the market for a very long time. And I think that is probably where the... Uh, the benefits and the uh, disadvantages lie, but also the possibility of where they might go. So I think, uh, interestingly, I was looking at your lack of visibility and lack of um, impromptu collaboration across the teams, which are both actually point not so much to technology, but to the human factor. So it is the, the fact we are sociable beings. We need to be with people. And a screen just doesn't really cut it. Um, and I think as a result, not using the technology uh, 
I'm going to say properly, because I think there are many things you can do with te technology which would actually overcome some of these um, disadvantages that people have, have perceived with what's happened so far. I think not using it properly will lead to further problems in terms of these sorts of elements. So it will lead to businesses suffering because they're not able to engage their staff properly. Um, I think beyond that, one of the things that I've seen, seen in my other role uh, as a NED is actually the increase in mental health issues and increase in mental health issues largely brought about by your circumstances, including how you work and where you work. Uh, I think there's going to be a big surge that everybody's going to have to deal with, including employers. Fabulous, thank you. So, so some much, much broader implications there, not just about legal careers themselves, but actually the impact on organizations uh, and indeed us on, on human beings as social creatures uh, and, and raising, I think, what are very critical mental health issues. Thank you. Um, Rustam, at a, at a, for an organization, you know, at the heart of digital working and, and, and the infrastructure that supports that, um, what about you? You must have had some chance to kind of look into the future about the implications of all this. Oh, I wish I could look into the future for implications of all this. I mean, look, and um, hi, everyone, to start with. Um, uh, look, I echo a lot of what Rash just said, but when I was kind of reflecting on the, on the question, you know, apart from saving yourself a fortune on takeaway coffee, you know, what, what, what's really changed? Because a lot of the stuff has stayed the same, right? The work hasn't gone anywhere, if you're lucky enough to say that. In, in our case, it certainly hasn't. You've still got to collaborate with your colleagues. You've still got to be across, you know, your work stack and what's happening in the business. Um, but the key thing for me, probably, which has been the differentiator, is tech. And what do I mean by that? I think before um, it felt a little bit optional. Some people love tech and adopt it pretty quickly. Other people kind of, you know, they'd rather not use it. But I think what I've definitely seen in, in my world anyway is that adoption of tech and certain types of tech really now is mandatory. You, you've got to be able to do it to, to do your job. And that has really been an interesting shift. I don't think it's just for legal careers. I think it's for, for everyone across, across uh, the working environment, especially office-based. So I think, um, I, think the, I think it was the Microsoft CEO who said something like, there's been two years of, uh, of uh, acceleration in tech due to the pandemic versus I don't know how many years before. Um, so tech is probably the one thing and if I look at the market, especially the last maybe five to 10 years, legal tech is not new, right? Nearly everybody on this call is probably using tech of some sort, but I think it has accelerated it and I think it will cause it to accelerate going forward. I guess the, 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 the negative and, and, and Rashta touched on this, um, spontaneity has gone a little bit. Um, and I think careers will suffer generally that, uh, uh, from that. You know, when I, when I think back to the career, you can be walking down the corridor and bump into your colleagues and maybe go for a quick coffee or maybe grab beer after work. Um, now everything's diarized. Now everything's diarized. Even socializing is diarized. Um, so that will have an impact, I think, on legal careers and other careers. And you're going to have to make much more of an effort to check in with people, much more of an effort to make sure you know what's going on in your business, your stakeholders and your team if you run teams. Um, so it's, it's definitely been an interesting time. Um, but, but I think probably tech and making sure you're, you're savvy and comfortable with tech and reaching out if you're not. Um, is, is pretty important, I think, going forward for, for, for lawyers. Brilliant. Thank, thanks, Rustam. And, and, and I think that adoption of tech, we'll just pick that up in a second. Uh, the other point, which from your answer, which I think really stands out is, you know, this idea of social capital and those relationships and, and the impacts, um, perhaps, of thinking about that differently. And I think that's another, builds really nicely on that Rashta's point about we're social creatures and those social connections really important not just for us from the mental health perspective but also in terms of our effectiveness of, of getting work done so really insightful thank you um dana you've built a built a business model ahead of its time um you know with remote working at the core um you must have some great insights about what this means for legal careers I, well, I'm a, an ever optimist, really, although I did note the socializing, the, the diarizing of the social life, which sounds like everybody's now a Londoner. That used to be what everybody said about us down south, where everything had to be lined up um, and, and very, very 
um, diarized. But um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a really great opportunity, you know, something I've been obviously waiting for a decade. And I'm excited because um, I think it's a really great opportunity for lawyers to be much closer to business. Um, they can become really part of the kind of system of the business rather than the just the document part of you know advising and you know the relationship and how do you make deals happen but actually understanding the technology underpinning those businesses and being much closer to those systems i think is something that um creating a kind of digital lawyer space which is you know as we heard before it's not optional anymore you cannot see yourself as a lawyer without being a digital the lawyer you really have to understand how tech enables the delivery of the legal service you prov provide and i think we're seeing definitely um, already much closer kind of integration between the sales team systems and the legal team you know suddenly we're becoming much more integrated i feel as lawyers within the business in a way that even when we said we are you know in business units it didn't feel there seemed to be a kind of friction but the borders have really melted. And I think that's really exciting because suddenly you can articulate the value of lawyering. You know, you can say, you know, I can really move this deal faster and you can see it because the sales people have the system to view it. Um, and I think it makes life easier for lawyers to articulate, you know, how they add value. Um, and so that's a really exciting opportunity. Um, the other thing that I, I find really exciting, I mean, I think the last year of working is not the usual flexible working I was championing let me be clear I've been working and co-working my nine-year-old in the same room different pressure different um, different pace really a, a very different kind of space from working around the family which is what I championed but I think what's really exciting is the inclusivity that the digital space also brings you can really bring talent on that you maybe weren't bringing before you can be much more um, you know um, flexible around somebody working from home if they have a disability or um, just really creating a more inclu inclusive culture within the workspace. And I think that's really exciting because again, it's about bringing a fresh set of skills, new talent, really going further afield to bring them in. Um, and that, I think that can only be a good thing. So especially, you know, um, you know, with talent being good talent, being hard to, to find, being able to go further and integrate them into the business seamlessly and make them be part of a team I know digitally, but still, these people sometimes wouldn't have had the uh, opportunity and now the opportunity is here and that's really exciting. And I think that all comes to, uh, uh, you know, to create a more positive culture in an organization. So in a, in a kind of funny way, I think, although the pandemic has been really hard and I'm the first to admit it's been really, really intense and definitely pressure on mental health and everything, it has in a way allowed us to be closer together, to see each other's lives a little bit more. Um, and a lot of time, a lot of the pressure was at work because people were trying to say, well, I'm, I'm not showing my children. Or I'm not talking about my family just in case I'm being judged on it. Actually, now it's become more accepted to be yourself. And that can also be a liberating factor. And obviously, when we have children back in school and more, you know, orderly kind of family lives, um, able to focus on the work without being interrupted all the time that can also play a really important part in how we work more effectively. So I think to be honest, it's a hard time, but really the future is looking bright from my point of view. Fantastic, thanks, Donna. And there's a there's a huge amount uh, huge amount in there, I guess, as I as I'd expect. I think the couple of things that I would I would pull out. So um, you very much built on that sense that Rustin gave of you know the importance of digital and that you know refusing to adopt is just not going to be an option anymore. But there's an interesting paradox in there, isn't there, as well, which is that. Rashta talked about the challenges that digital puts on us as human beings, and you highlighted the flip side of actually the opportunity to be more inclusive and to use technology to bring us together. And it reminds me of, uh, I'm physically located in Cambridge in the UK, and it reminds me of a, a slogan that was on the side of one of our museums after the pandemic started, which was, um, can be in further apart, bring us closer together. And I think that's a really interesting, interesting way of looking at things. So let me thank you for that. Let me pick up then on this this emerging theme that's, I guess, come out of what both you and Rustin said about the adoption of technology. And, you know, remote working is clearly a part of it, but there's been a much wider acceleration of digital adoption for in-house legal teams over the uh, over the past 12 months. And I think some of that has been necessity as processes and procedures and ways of working have moved online. 
But also there have definitely been general counsel that have seized this as an opportunity, have said, you know, we wouldn't have got budget for this, we wouldn't have got approval, we wouldn't have got IT team, we're going to do it now and we're going to get it done. Um, so if we think about this more rapid adoption of technology in the legal world, um, both in-house and I guess in the interface with law firms, um, Rustam, let me let me start with you and ask you, what do you think this means for the, the work that in-house lawyers do going forward? Um, <clears throat> great question. Um, so I guess from my perspective, um, and we touched on collaboration and, and the digital tools um, and how they've accelerated, you know, quite interestingly, I was looking back at when some of these tools first emerged and collaboration tools aren't new, right? You know, I think Skype for Business launched launched in 2004. Uh, Zoom was 2011. Um, Teams was 2017. So these things these things uh, have been around a while. What what I'm seeing in the in-house market, and and again talking just from from my own world, is uh, a much bigger emphasis on operations, and this tallies with with um, with 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 data and digital. So I think. The legal world, especially in, in my, my world, is catching up with the rest of the business. You know, resource management, demand management, you know, all these kind of things are just bread and butter for, for most for most businesses. And I think the in-house community is catching up and it's taken a while. And some in-house uh, teams are ahead of, of uh, ahead of others. But when I think about what's happening in the legal market, I think um, having tools to capture the type of work you're doing, how long it takes, the different variables, we're becoming much more data driven. And this is a trend that I think is just going to continue uh, in in-house. You know, we need much richer data about what we're, what we're working on, uh, who we're working for and all that good stuff, because cost pressures aren't going away. You know, complexity is only getting higher. Regulation is only coming out of the machine faster. Um, problems in the world now seem to be multifaceted. Right. I don't think that, that, that you know, when you look even at COVID and other other uh, other matters that have gone on in the corporate world in the past you know i think gone are the days where it's just a legal issue or just a commercial issue or, or just an operation issue they're multifaceted and legal organizations um need to get smarter about the work they're doing um, and have an understanding about where we're deploying our time and resources and i think data is one of the key things is, is one of the key things there so i am seeing a shift in the market to uh, an operational view and an operational perspective and also Look, there's so much hype. We all know there's so much hype about automation and AI and robots and et cetera, et cetera. But if we do believe that that kind of evolution will continue, then new opportunities are going to pop up for in-house lawyers and for law firms that maybe aren't traditional legal roles. You know, data analysts, data miners, you know, you've got all this data. What do I do with it? Um, so I think those kind of trends are going to continue. Um, uh, I think a much more kind of business lens, operational focus. Uh, on, on legal departments, um, because life ain't getting any simpler, Mark. <laughs> Fabulous. So, so one of the uh, one of the concepts I really like is this idea of uh, VUCA, volatile, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous environments. And business has to, as you say, business has to adapt to those, and the pressure on the in-house legal team as a result. I, I can absolutely see that, and the you know, the drive to this operational efficiency and metrics and, and data is pervasive throughout business. And uh, the days of the in-house legal team being a black box that was immune to this somehow and gave off a force field. Um, I absolutely agree with you that those days, those days are over. Uh, and that, that I think has some really interesting opportunities and also, as you say, implications for skills and, and capabilities. Um, so ab absolutely. Um, Dana, what's your what's your view on the you know the implications of this rapid tech adoption? Well, I think again it's great because um, it's something that we obviously championed <laughs> for a long time in the business. But um, it, it would be really interesting to me to see you know who will be the winners of the adoption, what will be the kind of waves, if you like, of what legal tech um, is most um, able to articulate the value the quickest. Um, I mean, I, I think it's fair to say that we've seen Microsoft being a massive winner in the kind of technology space in terms of how they've managed to roll out a lot of solutions really quickly. Um, so to me, I think it's more interesting to see what, what will be the elements that will be responding to this data requirements on the client end and who will be those providing what the client needs the quickest. 
And I'm, I think we've got a bit of a, a kind of, you know, a scramble um, in that space. There's lots of suppliers. Um, big kind of um, teams obviously require quite, these projects are quite big. So, you know, although they might have adopted Zoom or some other method of doing, you know, the collaboration piece or Slack or whatever, when it comes to transforming how work is being delivered, it can be taken, you know, it takes longer because you have to go for the whole, you know, contracts, repositories and all of that. So it's still, I think, too early to tell what shape it will take. I mean, obviously the collaborations tool will stay, you know, all the kind of mirror boards will stay, they work really well. But in terms of what will, you know, what systems will be integrated um, and work with the best, it's still, I think, quite early, early days. Obviously, if we were talking about AI and machine learning and, you know, come, you know, but there is no silver bullet, right? So there's going to be some kind of um, suite of solutions that will come into play that um, answer the client's need. Um, and I think we're not having much definition yet in, and so which legal tech has won. Um, so I, I think it's really interesting. I mean, I remember when we launched in the market, you know, we came, if you like, in the kind of shadow of Lehman Brothers and the pressures were the same, increased regulation, massive cost reduction, big economic, you know, shock. And we always said, you know, we're here to provide flexible, quality, affordable solutions, you know, and in a way that's what we're looking for still. Um, you know, those are able to tick those boxes to be flexible, easy to adopt, affordable. So you can actually have, if you've got a thousand people in your team, you can afford to have the system um, and uh, maintain good quality. Um, those are going to be critical, critical elements still. So in a way, the value system that we need to take um, remains unchanged from 10 years ago. Fabulous. Thank you. So, so another, a slightly different and interesting perspective, which is, um, I guess to support Rustam's view that the, the tech is going to be more, 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 more required and more pervasive, but raising the question, what is that tech? And definitely, if you look at the legal tech e ecosystem at the moment, it is on one hand, you know, thriving. There's a lot of capital going into there, some great new ideas, but at the same time, for organisations looking for enterprise grade offerings that are integrated with, with the rest of the organization, those are perhaps fewer, uh, fewer and further between. And uh, I would, uh, it would be remiss of me not to, uh, not to point to LexisNexis as an enterprise grade supplier of legal tech at this point. Um, the, um, it, it is, however, there's also the angle as well about adoption and getting people used to, used to these. And again, the more I think these platforms are pervasive and we have a common set of you know, features, functionalities that everybody gets used to, that will only increase the uh, the acceleration. That's so some really interesting insight there, Dana. Um, Rashta, what, what about your your view on this question? Um, well, very interesting what um, Rustam and Dana have dealt with, and I, I, I agree with all that. A couple of things I just wanted to um, say as a preface to what I'm going to say. In my experience, the legal profession is a bit of a troglodyte. It sort of follows rather than leads in terms of techn technological advancement or adoption of technological advancement. Now, I'll give you an example. When um, the, so I'm working um, as a consultant at a construction company, and as you know, construction, it's got a physical element. You can't build the thing remotely. You actually have to be there doing the work but it also has a huge amount of uh, technological capability. Um, and that goes into the work itself, but also in the background, the contracting and the uh, general operations, the finance, et cetera. So they're very good at leading technological advancement. In, uh, when the lockdown hit and everybody was working from home, we had a number of leading law firms who did not or could not function with things like Teams and Zoom. And we, they were scrabbling around to get their IT people to put it on their systems so they could actually join our calls. And I, I found that a little bit disconcerting actually, but it all just pointed to me to the late adopter syndrome, which is, you know, there's a traditional way of doing things and we'll carry on doing it regardless of what the end user really needs or wants. So one of my sort of complaints is the commercial imperative that's led by businesses is not easily picked up by law firms and sometimes actually totally ignored. So that's my little whinge about the disconnect 
of law firms with businesses. I think that what the rapid advancement and, and as I said, the digital transformation has brought about actually is what Rustam said, which is the uh, connection to and the need for um, firstly data collect, uh, collection and data analytical metrics that actually show you how you're performing. And they've become absolutely essential in the collaboration between the legal function and the business. And I think has added to that. So we're no longer, I think, sitting there, as you said, in a black box, I'd say in some sort of silo in the back room, but we've become a part of the team. And that's actually been brought about, I think more so by IT, because they can include us, as, as Dana said, they can include us more easily and quickly. And I think one of the things that, so as, as a theme of inclusivity that um, the transformation has allowed, is actually greater accessibility. So for leaders, for instance, one of the very dangers is that they become even more remote because they're no longer as visible as they were, walking around the, the floor or, you know, uh, bumping into people at the cooler. And now they have an added impetus to use the technology even more to remain visible, accessible and responsive. Um, so, that, you know, they would be the things that I think leaders need to do. And I think that um, I'm positive about it all. I think it is bringing about a very, very uh, significant um, demonstration of the um, value add that lawyers provide. Because I think in the past, that's been a huge burden that we just haven't been able to sometimes show. And as a head office um, expense, whatever you are, whether you're um, in-house or external, you can sometimes be a head office expense and not a project expense. Um, there's always a question of, well, what do you do? Why do we need you? Um, and how hard can it be? If this is my favorite. How hard can it be to read a piece of paper and understand it? Um, so I think for in-house lawyers in particular to continue sh continually show how they're an important part of the business is actually now uh, leading to, the, through technology, leading to a greater alignment between the goals of the business and what support legal teams can provide. So I think it's a plus plus, but I think the independent paradigm of the law firm, that has to change. And I haven't really seen that changing sufficiently yet. Fabulous. So, so some really nice connections there, I think. Um, where you ended up around the integration with the business and demonstrated value really ties nicely with Rustam's point about you know, metrics and, and being integrated with the business and, and meeting those operational aims to be able to create data to prove the value that you're adding, which is perhaps something that in the past has been, has been missed. And I also think your point about the connection, the technology interface with law firms ties nicely in with Donna's point about, you know, there needs to be winners and losers in this, in the tech ecosystem. So there is, you know, the efficiency that comes with having standards is, is really critical. Um, and certainly I know from the work I've done with law firms, uh, for them as well, they will often struggle by having multiple systems in, in place. And, you know, as opposed to kind of enterprise grade technology that we see in, in big corporations. Fantastic. So, so there's a huge um, amount, I think, for everybody to, to think about, us all included. Um, but where I'd like to kind of finish the formal part of the, of the Q&A is actually to really personalise it, to think about individuals and their place in, in the environment. And if you imagine now that you were entering the legal profession, having heard what we've heard about how we think the world is, is going to change, um, if you think about kind of the key skills, capabilities that you would want to develop to have a really successful legal career, I'm curious what they would be. Let, let's start with uh, start with Dana. <laughs> Home life, um, all in one room. Um, yes, so individual skills, I believe, is the question. How can we make the right lawyers of the future? Well, so there's nothing really, I think, that's changed around black letter law. You know, you need to know your 
subject. Um, what I think is changing is around how you behave and also how you build the resilience to um, respond to all the challenges coming your way. Um, so to me, I think the biggest thing that one needs to develop is some kind of form of resilience um, around, um, you know, working within organizations that, are, you know, we, we heard earlier, you've got all this speed, um, the acceleration of change, managing that change. How do you reposition? Because, you know, I think this idea of the one linear career, you go one, you know, you start here and you end up there and you can absolutely control that path. Um, it's it really doesn't exist anymore. So if you're starting now and you're thinking, well, do I want to be a leader in 10 years time? You'll probably take a very, very different route um, into the profession compared to the, the, the well, even my generation. So being able to adapt, to um, be resilient uh, and to take on change and actually see it as a learning opportunity rather than as a, you know, distracting force. Um, I think they are, you know, character building um, qualities really, as opposed to necessarily just black letter law. Um, character will play a big part, I think, especially with corporates starting to also articulate purpose and a kind of direction as organizations, you know, they will want to see that fit uh, between who they bring in, do they stand for our values? And I think they will mean quite a lot more in the coming decade than maybe they've meant in the last de decade. So that's an exciting thing, um, again. Fantastic. So really focusing on kind of those um, those softer capabilities around resilience, agility, a, a adaptation to, to change and uh, um, arguably kind of EQ is is very much uh, tied in with that. Um, Rashta, let's go to you next. If you were entering the profession, where would you kind of put your time investment in terms of the skills and capabilities you'd want to build up? Well, wow. Wow. Um my children used to talk about um, the black and white olden days because when you look at black and white photos, they thought they were just black and white. We just lived in a black and white world. And I'm from the black and white olden days because I'm about a million, 100 million years old. Um, and my, when I started in the profession, it was, you know, that we, we used to have a typist pool in chambers and they typed everything. So I, I didn't even know how to type. Um, I, di I am a, autodidact when it comes to technology. I've learned everything myself. And one of the reasons I think that I've been able to learn, so this is without asking my children or friends, is I was, pre I was prepared to explore. So whenever, you know, I got a new software thing, I explored it. I just, you know, clicked on everything to see what it did and so on. So I think that notion of agility and adaptability is really, really important. You've got to be able, you can't be stuck in whatever time you know, uh, was your heyday, your golden days or whatever, you, your golden years. You have to move on and that means being prepared to explore new things, new ways of doing things um, and, and, and hopefully leading, you know, not just adopting those new things, but adapting to a new way of life. In this current climate and with the new... Um, untrained lawyers are going to come through because um, I do feel for the people who started last year either as pupils or um, as training con trainees in, on training contracts their life is completely different to what they could have contemplated a year before so they would have heard all these stories about what it is to be a lawyer in a law firm or as a, a barrister and none of that is happening none of it so it, it really is being thrown into the deep end, into sort of shark infested waters and saying, just see if you can get to the shore. So it is a really, really difficult position to be in. If I could, so other than resilience, agility, ability to adapt and looking forward to things and being prepared to explore your surroundings and how you live and work. One thing I'd say that has become really important and it was drummed into me when I was a baby barrister and I've tried never to forget it and I try and drum it into everybody else. A key skill that everybody really needs to have and particularly in this world where we're speaking to the screen is listening and really listening actively because that's when you'll pick out things in somebody's voice that doesn't sound right um, You'll pick out something that you need to deal with. You'll pick out many things you didn't know. 
Um, so if some, <laughs> I'm trying not to show shock when the project team tells me something like, um, oh, we've got a small claim for 400 days of extension of time on our project, which we should have finished a year and a half ago. I try not to go, oh, you know. <laughs> So, but it's listening, it's actually listening actively to what's going on, because the only way you're going to contribute through this sort of technology is to be able to respond to the thing that they've said. Um, and, you know, it applies equally, for instance, you know, hearings now in court or mediations. It's, you know, I've been on a couple of virtual mediations and they've worked fantastically because people are listening. And that also means not talking over someone, because if you're talking over someone, you're not listening. So, yes, you know, try and 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 adopt things adapt to your situations try and move flexibly to things that are happening but you know most of all listen to what's going on around you and to the people who are working with you what a what a what a great and i think thoughtful answer that listening you know in the in the world of all this technology that fundamental human capability comes to the fore so i, I really like that and i think that that also supports a lot of that kind of EQ um kind of the soft skills that were, were coming through from Dana as well. Um, fabulous. Rustam, what, what about you? If you were if you were making your bets at the start of your career, what would you where would you invest your time and efforts to, to get better? Yeah, it's a really tough question. Um, and I echo so much of what Rashta and Dana have said. Um, <clears throat> it's really hard. It's really hard for me to remember, Mark. It's so long ago, right? Um, but I tell you what I what, what what I see when I think about BT and large corporates. What what I'm definitely seeing, and I touched on it before, is problems becoming kind of more multidisciplinary or multifaceted. Um, I'm also seeing a desire for organisations to to want leaders who can lead big teams, deliver projects, um, and it's more important, maybe you know, rather than is the person an accountant or a lawyer or an engineer, you know. Uh, solving big hairy problems and delivering goals um and I, i'm a great believer in this concept which is not new uh, but i read about it three four years ago and, and now i and now i bore my team city about it uh, about the t-shaped lawyer you know where you have a deep skill in the vertical being the law and and i so re i so repeat what dana said like l l there's so much stuff about soft skills but let's not forget we we need to know the basics of law right that's fundamentally why why we're brought in um but the, the deep knowledge being your legal expertise and then the, the, the T, the horizontal bit being being a, a, a little bit of knowledge of other areas. And, and I would say that I would say, look, listen, um, you know, you, you've got to have your eyes open to tech. You've got to be comfortable with tech. Um, you, you've got to try and understand data a little bit. And you don't need to be a, you know, a data miner, but you should probably understand how this stuff works just a little bit. But also be a little bit more curious. And again, I'm just talking for the commercial world because, you know, this advice for somebody who wants to be a criminal silk is, is not going to resonate. Um, but I think having an understanding of brand management, crisis management, being able to read a P&L and a balance sheet, understanding how resources are done, understanding operations, understanding your business. You know, I think if you're a lawyer, for example, at BT and you understand how this business works, you understand where we make money, what the big risks are, you know, how, how things work. How do we deliver this, these, these products? You're going to be a much more effective lawyer, all right? Because you're going to be able to listen, like Rashta said, uh, and really understand the problems. And also, when you're, you know, if you're negotiating something, right? If you know your business inside out, you're just going to be much better at advising the business um, and understanding the, the problem. So I would say, broaden your your skill set a little bit. Be comfortable reading a P and L. Understand a little bit about, um, you know, operations and how and how your company and how companies make money. Um, understand a little bit about regulation and risk so it's it's developing this holistic view uh of of business um that that's probably what i would i would i would suggest you know of course you've got to nail your tort exam and your your equity and trust exam um but as you start thinking about the commercial world if that's where you want to go start looking a little bit around the edges and the, and, and outside your swim lane a bit brilliant thank you so really like that so you know all, all of the panelists have kind of said you know there is a um the black letter law is taken as a given that's table stakes that's the price of entry but on top of that we need these you know the eq the resilience the ability to listen 
And then we need that broader commercial understanding. And, and as you talked, uh, again, all three of you about, you know, the integration with the business, getting closer to the business, that understanding, that able to contextualize the legal work is going to be, is going to be critical. And the other, the other strand that I heard across all three of you, although not necessarily articulated explicitly, is around leadership. Um, and some of the characteristics of leadership and, and thinking about being a leader, not in a hierarchical sense of your job title, but in sense of having a clear vision of where you wanted to go, motivating and engaging people. Um, I will just use my uh, my chair's position to, uh, to offer one more thought to that. And uh, that's the ability to influence effectively. So I think as organizations get less hierarchical and more complex, uh, particularly for people coming into their careers early where they don't have positional authority, the ability to influence, which goes back to those, you know, very, uh, very critical EQ type skills, I think, I think becomes ever more important. And I would love to see kind of influence and uh, persuasion and those kind of skills be on the, on the curriculum. So um, panel, we are, we are about out of time of the, for the formal thing. Um, I know we've got a, a couple of questions to uh, to get to, um, so let me uh, let me just fire those, and I'll, I'll ask um, whoever wants to answer this just just jump in. Um, we've probably got time for a couple before we wrap up. So the first one was a really interesting one about remote working and the impact on juniors. So um, you know, particularly the you know the less experienced colleagues. Um, What's been the impact of remote working and, and what suggestions might you have for our audience in, in how, to, uh, how to deal with that? Rashda. Um, Mark, I did actually send a little note to the person who asked that question. And I think one of, one of the things I've seen the most is, you know, other than the fact, I think we mentioned uh, more junior people are likely to be in a house of four other people. They're working at the kitchen or staying in a bedroom all day. But I think one of the uh, things I've come across is because uh, I've had calls from more junior people um, because they haven't didn't know what else who else to turn to is the it, I said perception in my answer that I think to be fair it is probably true uh, not mere perception on the part of the junior person is sort of the lack of support that they would ordinarily have received on a day to day basis as they could wander around. Um, the office asking people more senior to them running things past them um, and sometimes you just need that to ensure you're not sort of being persuaded by your own propaganda especially a, as a junior person you're researching a point you can easily think this is the answer when actually it's totally wrong that sort of thing is harder to do because it does as, as both Rostam and, and, and Dana said you have to sort of book everything in and buy that time the moment is gone the support that you needed isn't there so I think the, the the sense that they're they're not getting that support because of the lack of physical interaction is one of the things that I I've seen fabulous thank you Donna Rustin anything to to add to that um we've actually onboarded this this during the pandemic seven seven new lawyers and um I really feel for them because it's really, really difficult joining a big organization at the best of times. Um, but they have not obviously come into any offices. They haven't met anybody face to face. Um, and we've been very conscious of that. And, and I, I think what, what Rash has said, I'd 100% agree with, because we've had to turn the volume up, a volume up on checking in. You know, you have to make time to check in. You have to make time and carve time out to support them. We've encouraged them to come together as a collective as well. Um, it's just much more focused effort uh, on, on to communicate and support and asking other colleagues in the team, look guys, can you just pick up the phone to them, have a chat with them? You know, I've done the same as well, very informal. Um, so the support network is, is really, really crucial, I think. Um, and, and something that, you know, it takes a lot of effort. It certainly can't be, can't be left, 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 uh, left to others to necessarily do or taken for granted. So. I, I really think that's the big one. So there's some some really important lessons there for I think for those of us who are more experienced to actually take the initiative. And uh, one of the phrases I've I've heard elsewhere is structured spontaneity. 
um, which is to, to Dana's point about, you know, you're not going to bump into them. So you need to make chance, you know, you need to make those collisions happen. Um, we have another great question about um, the challenges of legal transformation, saying we're, we're talking about this pace of adoption, yet for many organisations, they haven't got the basics such as smart contracts and, and electronic signatures in place. Um, just I'll ask one of you just for a one minute um, observation on that challenge, um, and then we'll need to we'll need to wrap up. Who's going to uh, who's going to offer a view on, on that? I'm, I'm happy to mark only for this reason, because I work in the construction industry, the contracts are anywhere between 450 pages and a few thousand. And uh, one of the difficulties for us has been to be able to say online, this is the contract and for the person to sign the right pieces of paper. We have, we have sufficient difficulties in construction doing that with hard copies. So I think for us, the real challenge has been, and I'm talking about the construction infrastructure industry generally, is actually finding a platform that will allow us to upload the documents in a way that somebody can say, yep, this is the contract. Um, and so at the moment, we are still doing it the old fashioned way, wet signatures on a hard copy until we yeah. find a proper platform. So any tech person out there, if you want to try and create one for us, please go right ahead. Fabulous. Do, 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 do you mind, Mark, if I just add one thing, because uh, it goes to yours, your influencing point. Um, I think the shortest answer is money. Um, you know, the the the, the in in house anyway. Uh, the in house legal team is not at the top of the list when it comes to uh, g giving us money for investment. So we have to persuade somebody to give us some money. Um, and in order to do that, you have to be able to articulate the value add in and amongst everyone else asking for for money. So I think you're completely right. You know, we're talking about tech, but you know, I haven't even got I haven't even got a document management system. Um, it, it, it's just wh whether your leadership can, can can get to the CFO ahead of the others and persuade them to give them the cash, because it's not that they, we don't want it, it's just sometimes we just can't get it. Fabulous, fabulous. So sharpen those influence in, in skills. <laughs> and uh, that, that's a great way, I think, to end. So um, we're going to have to call it a, uh, a day at that point. Thank you all. Um, on behalf of all of us to the panelists, you've been amazing. Thank you very much. Um, just before I hand over Laura, if I if I kind of sum up that what I take away from today is in the midst of such difficult and challenging times, there genuinely is a lot of reason for opportunity. And I think hope coming out of today, you know, we started by highlighting that, you know, that loss of some of that human connection, some of the mental health challenges. But also we see opportunities to get more embedded into the business, to become more business-like, to adopt efficiency and operational processes, to understand the business better, to become more integrated and, and more critical. And technology as a, as a way of enabling that is, uh, is clearly here to stay. So um, thank you all again. And uh, thank you, Laura, for asking me to be part of this. And I'll hand over to you to, to close. Thank you, Mark. And yes, I'll just echo um, our thanks to Dana, Rustam and Rashda. Um, I'm sure everybody listening has enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. Um, you might have noticed me scribbling away on occasion. I've got some lovely sign bites. Um, we will be sharing thoughts um, and continuing the conversation. Um, so if you don't already uh, keep an eye on our website um, or the LexisNexis Future of Law blog um, do look us up and we will keep the conversation going um, but in the meantime I will say thank you and I hope everybody enjoys the rest of their day bye bye thank bye. you bye, bye. bye. thank Thanks. you guys bye